don't know, this is the first in our um, Low Carbon Hub webinar series. So first of all, apologies, you're our guinea pigs. So when um, we don't get things quite right technically, apologies in advance. Um, we've got a great series of um, talks coming up. So um, Tuesday nights um, at this time, you can find out more on our website and the Facebook um the low carbon hub facebook where you can sign up next week it's malcolm mcculloch talking about the energy system then we've got mel bryce from sscen telling us more uh, more detail of project leo which we'll be hearing more about later and how it's gone in the first year and more planned in the future as well so if you um, want to hear more about those do as i say sign up you can sign up to our newsletter follow us on the facebook page and we'll also be emailing out as um, more of those um, come up in the series so um, we'll just wait one or two more minutes and then we can get going Just to let you all know, we're going to be recording this webinar as we've had um, a number of people in contact who can't make this particular slot, but would be very keen to find out more about um, what we've had to say. So we are recording that to share it on our YouTube channel later. Great to see more people from various groups joining us. You have all the knowledge, Saskia. I'm just <laughs> seeing people coming up on the chat line. That's fantastic. Right. Um, I think we'll give them 30 seconds more and um, and then we can get going, as I'm sure lots of people are very keen to get back out into the amazing sunshine we've been having, which has been fabulous for our solar panels. Right, I'm going to just start screen sharing. So if you bear with me for one moment. Right, it's um, coming up to almost five past, so I think um, we ought to get cracking really. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this, as I said, is the first in our series of webinars. It's about investing the low carbon hub, your questions answered. And we're aware that although we're delighted to be joined by lots of our current members, we also have um, people who may be new to the organization um, with us today. So we're going to start with a quick overview of the hub and the Community Energy Fund, which is the current investment opportunity we have. Then uh, Barbara will be saying a little bit more about Project Leo, which is our really exciting program at the moment that we're particularly keen to raise investment to help support. And then a little bit more into the practicalities of investing. We um, are anticipating talking for around half an hour, um, taking your questions as we go, and then lots of time for your questions after. So do please, if you have questions as they come up, pop them in the chat channel and we will be um we'll be looking through those as we go now um just to flag up i've got the slides unfortunately that means i can't see the chat channel so barbara i'm dependent on you there and i know my colleague tabitha is also there and perhaps she can help us if we are missing questions any that we don't manage to answer as we go through we'll also make sure we run through all of those at the end so I was just going to start off with a very quick overview of the Low Carbon Hub. For those of you who don't know us, we are a Oxfordshire-based social enterprise and we're really out to prove that it is possible to meet our energy needs in a way that is good for people and good for the planet. We set up the Community Energy Fund as a way um, two years ago now, as a way that people can put their savings to work to um, support local solutions that we are um, trying to deliver that help tackle the climate crisis. And just going to start by setting out exactly how those, um, the fund works. So when people invest in us, um, the money that people invest is used by solar panels. Um, so this is an array at a local primary school. This is Middle Barton Primary School. 
And these panels are um, paid for using the capital from the investment we uh, receive. They're generating green electricity, so immediately doing a bit to reduce Oxfordshire's carbon footprint. That electricity is supplied to the school at a discount, so the school's saving money. And um, the income we get from that and from this being a, um, this particular array being a panel set that was uh, built during the feed-in tariff, um, we get also income from the export of the feeding tariff. All that income is used to, first of all, pay our investors a modest return for their um, capital, because without that capital, we wouldn't have been able to put the panels in. Um, and then all that surplus is then um, donated to support further carbon carbon cutting activity, hard to say, carbon cutting activity across the county. So this set of um, panels here at Middle Barton is just one of 45 arrays that we've installed and managed across Oxfordshire. Um, the low carbon hub, thanks to investment from our members, also has installed and manages the largest community owned hydro on the Thames, which is at Sanford, just south of Oxford. So between them, all of these um, installations are generating 4.4 gigawatt hours of green electricity a year. It's kind of a nebulous figure if you're not um, used to power generation, but that's enough to power 100 and, well, sorry, 1,500 typical homes. So together, that's already beginning to make a tangible contribution to reducing Oxfordshire's carbon footprint. Um, so I said we wanted to be good for the planet, and that's the first part, but we also want to be um, good for people. We've mentioned that we're helping our investors um, generate a modest income in return for their um, investment in us, so we pay an interest rate. The host organisations, such as Middle Barton School, are getting a um, reduced um, discount to their electricity. And um, on top of that, we're generating a surplus which um, is then being reinvested into further carbon activity. So just showing you here on the screen, we have a map of where all of those different um, installations are. If you want to go and look at more detail, you can go to a thing called the People's Power Station that we've set up. So peoplespowerstation.org and you can go and click, this is where the graphic comes from, you can click on each of these different sites and it will tell you a bit more about the, each of those arrays, how much they're generating, um, even show you the live um, generation at that moment in time so you can go and explore our full set of renewable installations. And um, as I say, good for people for us, we've got um, over a thousand investor members who've invested almost um, six million pounds in the hub now. And without that capital, we would not have been able to um, carry out those projects. 37 host organizations getting that discount. And as I said, the um, surplus, all of our profits are then donated for further carbon cutting activity. And um, some of that funds goes to a really crucial group of um, low carbon community groups across the county. They've currently got 26 community shareholders who own part of the hub. And um, they are amazing bunch. And I'm brilliant to see that there's some representatives from these groups currently watching tonight. Um, these 26 community groups are active in their communities doing the most extraordinary range of activities, um, everything from encouraging um, people to use less energy, um, seedling swaps, tree planting, might be doing um, thermal imaging uh, projects, a huge range of things to improve the sustainability of their um, community and we offer these groups grants. So that's part of what we do with the spare money that we have for this uh, surplus income. Um, but we also have a number of other projects that we carry out. So we support free energy audits for community buildings so that community buildings can better understand how that they can improve the energy performance of their buildings. So last year, 66 um, energy audits were carried out, um, in part, we should say, in thanks to a grant from West Mills Solar, who are another community-owned um, energy cooperative in the county. 
we gave grants to our community organizations um, a lot of this was also supporting um, things like in the top program there amazing um, organization called kids can which is set up by a volunteer from west oxford who was very keen to try and support climate change activity um, education particularly at a primary school level to help children be able to talk about what can be a really overwhelming topic of climate change um, in a way that they would find understanding and empowering Another example here, we've got the middle group there who've been doing some thermal imaging cameras from the Leaf and Rose Hill area and um, Kirklinton, which we were really pleased to support with putting solar panels on their community building. So loads of amazing community grants. Um, we also support Less CO2 programme, which is helping schools improve their energy performance across the county. It's a free performer, a free programme that's run for schools. It's still continuing. We're still taking sign ups despite the current situation. And all those schools are offered free um, energy audits as well so that they can find ways that they can reduce their energy bills and their um, energy use. And we also run a help desk. So loads of practical support, um, advice, and um, information that we provide as the Low Carbon Hub, often in conjunction with many, many partners. Um, as well as that support and advice, the other thing that we're really um, happy to be able to do with some of this funding is to use it for innovation work. So, um, a lot of what we've focused on over the last year or so has been around innovation in terms of how do we help power down? We know that powering up this more green energy is just part of the solution if we're going to really tackle climate change. We also need to stop using so much power in the first place to so make our buildings and our homes more energy efficient. So um, the funding that we've had from um, the community donations has been able um, enabling us to get match funding in from government grants to do things like trial the cozy homes program that some of you may have heard of and we've also just started a new project called um i've got to get it right energy solutions oxfordshire which is a similar program for um smes that we're now going to be trialing our buildings are such a crucial part of our um our our use of energy that the more we can do to improve the fabric of those buildings um, the better chance we've got of reducing our overall um, carbon footprint as a county and our biggest most exciting project at the moment is project leo and i'm going to hand over to barbara to tell you more about that thanks saski um, so i'm giving a bit of a flavor here of the um in, in before we have the next two webinars that are going to be delivered by uh, the wonderful um, Professor McCulloch from Oxford University and Mel Bryce from SSEN. So this is a sort of taster for the much deeper dive that they'll do um, in the next two of the webinar series. So the slide that we've got showing here is um, giving you a sense of the partnership that we have working on LEO. LEO itself means Local Energy Oxfordshire, and it's a £40 million project, um, that's, and that £40 million is made up of match funding from partners, £27 million and £13 million of grant funding from Innovate UK. And that uh, programme uh, is there to trial local energy solutions as it says on the slide, to accelerate the transition to a zero carbon energy system. I'll go in a little bit more into what we mean by that um, over the next few slides. But the, uh, the partnership, I think, is very important um, for you to see. We are very proud that as the Low Carbon Hub group of social enterprises, we can take part in a partnership of this size and of this quality to address the most serious problem that we're facing as a society. Um, the leverage that we get on our community benefit surpluses is the only reason we can take part in this sort of project. The leverage that we get from those community benefit surpluses that are enabled by the investment that you put into our community energy fund um, is a really um, special USP of what the low carbon hub does. 
Um, and it allowed us to um, play a large role in convening this partnership right at the beginning of the process. It's led the partnership by Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks. Um, and that's important because they are the main distribution network operator for Oxfordshire. Um, and they've really seen the potential uh, for them in understanding how they make the transition to distribution systems operator, a neutral market facilitator in the new energy world. Then, of course, being able to work with Oxford University, Oxford Brookes University, the City Council, the County Council, um, and then big organisations like EDF Energy and exciting new startups like um, Open Utility or Piclo, Origami Energy and uh, Nuve. So we're playing, uh, we're punching pretty massively above our weight, I would say, and it's all due to our investors. Thanks, Saski. Next one. So Project Leo, what's it there to do? Well, it is there to help us work out how we go from this image, which um, as all of us locals will know, is uh, what uh, Didcot power station used to look like when it was a coal fired part, um, part A and a um, gas fired um, Didcot B. Um, all of those cooling towers that you can see sending steam into the atmosphere have now gone. They've been blown up. We just have the combined cycle gas turbine left. Um, and that is likely to be de decommissioned. It was going to be decommissioned by the end of the decade, but we're, we're there. So <laughs> not quite sure whether that's when that's going, but it will be going. And that turns Oxfordshire from part of that very centralised, very fossil fuel driven Rolls Royce, frankly, system that we've had in the UK to the next slide, hopefully. Um, very exporting county to, to one that imports all of its energy. So how do we encompass that change in a way that deals with the climate emergency and benefits everybody who lives in Oxfordshire? Um, we mean everybody um, who lives in Oxfordshire. Clearly, you wouldn't be on this webinar if you didn't um, have a sense of where we're going with that transition, which, which is to have this um, sort of very decentralised, very localised uh, energy grid where most of the transactions, most of the production and the use of energy happens at what is called the grid edge, the low voltage network, the distribution network. Um, how do we go from a very centralised, few enormous power stations sending all of their electricity into the transmission system to a system where we have millions of little decentralized renewable energy resources um, that are being shared locally and sent both ways. So uh, people receiving energy, but also sending energy out to the grid. It's, it's not a trivial problem, but it's one that we've really got to solve. And what we're saying in Project LEO is that we actually have all the components that we need to make that change. Yes, we'll see new things come on. Yes, we'll improve the technologies that we've got, but actually all of the components are there. We've just, we've just got to work out how to put all of those together, how to make them communicate with each other, how to share the data that's generated safely, um, and how then to run a market where you can sell flexibility services to the grid and you can sell energy services to people who want to use the energy. And we're assuming in making, all of, in making that change to this sort of energy system that we'll do it best if we're really good at reducing demand. So the cosy homes and the energy solutions Oxfordshire that Saski was talking about are an absolutely fundamental part for us of the whole exercise. So what does that mean for Oxfordshire? Why is Oxfordshire a good place um, to be doing this stuff? Well, first of all, we have a grid that is very tight in terms of its capacity. So um, it's quite hard to keep ad adding connections for renewable energy to it. Uh, and in some areas of the county, it's quite hard to um, connect new developments without 
significant up upgrading, which of course costs money. But also a reason for doing it in Oxfordshire is because um, we, as well as Didka going, and therefore we as a county having a need to do this, we know a lot about the energy mix that we have in Oxfordshire at the moment. And it's actually the, the job that we have to do uh, from now on is actually mainly about solar. So this slide shows what's happened to the energy mix in Oxfordshire since the feed-in tariff came in. And you can see we've had a massive increase in um, renewable energy installation in the county. Uh, and this gives a sense of um, what technologies um, have been used for that. Uh, and you can see that um, landfill gas and sewage, sewage gas um, are, part, are agreed to be part of that um, renewables mix. Let's not have a conversation about whether they should be or not. But if we're looking forward from here to where we need to get to by 2030, next slide, Saski. Yay. Uh, this is what we need to do. Um, we've used, we've developed the wind. We've got one wind farm. We're not a very windy county and we have lots of MOD installations who don't like wind near them. Um, we've developed our hydro on the River Thames pretty much. And we've um, put two massive AD plants in at Cassington and Wallingford that take all of the curbside food waste from the county and in fact buy that in from other places. So what's left for the county is solar and if we're going to get to 2030 with the targets that were written into the energy strategy before the climate emergency hit, then we need to increase our solar capacity by sixfold. Um, to get to that point. Um, my view of that is that um, if the market conditions are right, it is not a problem technically to develop that amount of solar. And in fact, we're seeing planning applications coming in all over the county now for really quite large solar farms. To get to that point across the county would need a few percent of our land area. It's not massive. Uh, it would also be great if we uh, developed as much of our rooftop solar as we could, but don't under underestimate the difficulties of that, and we can go through those um, later in discussion if people want to. Um, but the questions around that for a local energy market are, firstly, how do we do that? this without the fits? Um, because as soon as you don't have the fits, which we now don't have, you have to stack the value, using the jargon, from lots of different sources of, of income, each of which has their contract, and all of which might have a contract that's over a different period of time. So making the project investable is far harder than it was uh, when we had the feed-in tariff. How do we do that? whilst avoiding what we call solar devaluation. Um, and if any of you have been um, following the news at the moment during COVID, you will know that um, the massive redu reduction in energy demand we've had because of lockdown has meant that energy prices have really gone through the floor because we've got, even as things stand, too much fossil fuel and too much solar for our needs. That's what we mean by solar devaluation. If we keep developing solar, how do we do that in a way that doesn't massively over provide for the summer period? And we'll come on to that in another slide. And I was just, oh, I was just going to interject there and say anyone who's interested in understanding more about how energy consumption has changed during the time of COVID in two weeks time, I know Mel Bryce from SSEN will be touching on that in her talk. Exactly. Oh, so, sorry. sorry. Third question. Right. I've got to do. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Third question is: Can the network cope with that? Which is not just a solar situation, but given that um, Oxfordshire is is um, um, our county boundaries work quite well with the SSEN DNO boundaries, is is a very good place to be asking. Okay, working with one DNO working with one set of institutions, what are the, what's the set of problems we have to solve here? 
and how do we reduce demand enough to make more capacity so that more renewable can happen on the grid um, without needing to invest massively over invest one might say in the wires and switches that um, that we would need otherwise and next slide <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there at the end. thank you uh, the way that we do that um, is by moving energy through time as well as through space so we already have the the grid to move energy through space but we have to work out how to move it through time you will all i'm sure be familiar with the idea of the um peaks the morning and evening peak when we all get on up and put the energy the kettle on and then we all come home from work or school in the evening and we put the kettle on we watch the football and we put the kettle on um, we also uh, like eating hot e evening meals in the UK, uh, which means that we all cook a lot in the evening as well. So how do we deal with that? But that's actually quite an easy problem to solve. Um, projects have been demonstrating how that can happen. You put enough storage in there, whether it's battery or other forms of storage. It's quite easy to do that. Much more difficult to think about the course of a year interseasonal shifting through time when you've got a mainly solar-based um, energy system. So one of the things that Project LEO is looking at is how do all of these projects help the DNO to deal with peak um, capacity issues um, so that we can help not having such a peak of demand on the system? How can uh, all of these projects help to deal with constraints when there's a blockage in the system somewhere and the DNO needs our help to temporarily to unblock that. How can we trade with each other in a way that helps us not to be drawing down from either the distribution network or the transition transmission network. All of this needs to be worked out and um, the technology we now have in various forms of storage hydrogen included to think about how we might do that to the scale that we need but we then need all of the communication systems and the contracting systems um, which will allow us to be selling trading services in in the way that's required um, in order to make all the shapes work for the energy system because as you all know i'm sure electricity is very tricky thing in that it's it's pretty dangerous if you get it wrong it can burn things out and blow up quite easily uh, and it's also difficult to store so why do we need money <laughs> um we've launched an appeal at the moment for to raise a one and a half million pounds currently of new investment in the low carbon hub um, particularly through a vehicle called the community energy fund and the reason we need that equity at the moment is that we um that's good can i just ask a question oh. on behalf of greg who needs to leave for another conference how can he get hold of the recording it will be available on our youtube channel later in the week Thank and you. we will send out an email to everyone so you know where you can find it if that helps I'm sorry to interrupt okay so um all of these um as barbara said the the very first thing we need to do as a county is to increase our solar generation capacity um by as much as sixfold is the estimate so first thing we need is just to be generating more green renewable energy so we need more solar panels um, we are all continuing wherever possible to look for opportunities for roof mounted solar and we have two more projects that have just come online that we um, need to put the equity in to pay for that capital one at um, West Whitney primary and one at Langford village community primary school so we're continuing that roof mounted project however um, we also now start need to start looking at ground mount solar this is going to be something that we've got to consider if we're really going to see this uplift in electricity that's being supplied in the county not only to push and to displace the fossil fuel um, 
energy that's currently generated, but also if we're looking to shift transport and heating to electricity, things that um, we're going to have to really start to consider in a um, wholesale way if we're going to really decarbonize heating and transport. So, so the very first thing is to increase that generation. Um, second of all, once we've got that much larger generation capacity, so all of our existing um, generating assets, as we call them, as well as these um, larger anchor loads, hoping to have at least one um, community owned solar, um, Brown Mount Solar Park in the hubs portfolio in the next few months. Um, that's when we can also start using these to trial some of the things that Barbara was talking about. So by using this generation to understand how can we start to um, balance at a local level energy need? How can we start to even begin to see what's happening at a local energy level out in that distribution network? One thing that we're learning more, more about is how little is actually known about every spot of energy that is generated or used at a um, sort of node by node point. So the more that we can start to collect that data and understand how we can use that data to manage millisecond by millisecond as well as that inter um, seasonal balancing that needs to happen um, the um, the more that that learning at a real grid edge level can happen with the assets that we've got um, the better prepared will be to start using local energy to accelerate that transition to a net zero energy system that um, is our ultimate game um, end of our uh, so goal not game um, now, because of Project LEO, we have got the most extraordinary opportunity to actually trial those in a real world situation. We've got this amazing bunch of partners um, and experts who can help us do those trials through funding from our investors. We're creating those assets. The funding then unlocks grant funding from Innovate UK. So all of that innovation, all of that testing is funded using um, Innovate UK grant funding, which is only unlocked because of match funding coming in into those um, into the creation of the solar arrays. So that's your money going into tried and tested technologies, but then unlocking all this extraordinary innovation that's carried out. So the minimum investment is uh, £250. Maximum investment, if you happen to have very deep pockets, is 100000 The deadline for the current raise is the 10th of June. As with all of our investors, um, we are able to offer an interest payment. The target interest rate for the first four years is 4%, and then that rises to 5% um, at the end of four years. Also at the end of four years is when you also have the right to um, apply for your capital to be returned to you. We really need to stress to people two things. First of all, um, we really hope that investors, when they um, entrust us with their funds, are aware that this is a very capital intensive project and our projects are modelled over 20 years. So. Um, it's hard for us to be able to release all the capital immediately. So please, if you're going to invest, view it as a very long term project. We understand um, in terms of investment, we do appreciate that situations change and people may need their capital back sooner, which is why we have this mechanism to apply. But we cannot guarantee that you will get your funding um, that you've invested in us back immediately. So we need people to be really aware of that. Um, and also this is um, funding where your capital is at risk and there are no guaranteed returns. We've done some very careful modelling, which is what, what we base the target interest rates on, but they are only a target, they're not guaranteed. So most of our um, investors, um, when they come and invest in us, we, we people are often very pleased at the amount of interest that we can offer. But many people are also really keen in understanding that social and environmental return, which are to many just as important, if not more so than the financial returns. So we hope that if you're considering investing in the low carbon hub, you'll see that investment in the round and just an amazing way of turning your savings that might be languishing in a 
current account or our savings account with very low interest rate could actually go out there and start kickstarting some of this amazing innovation we've been talking about. So um, if you are considering investing, then um, go to our website, lowcarbonhub.org, and there's a whole section on there with lots of background materials, including our share offer document. It's really important that you take the time to read um, this in detail and the supporting materials so that you understand exactly what's involved and we set out um, the full risks of investment as well as a lot more detail about the benefits that are um, generated through your support and if you're ready to invest then click on the link and it's all done online through our investment partner um, platform FX so all the links are there so um, before we start going into some more of the questions, did just want to flag up, as I mentioned, that we've got many more webinars coming up. Um, next Tuesday, Professor Malcolm McCulloch is talking about um, the energy system transition and the role for local energy in that. We're absolutely thrilled that Malcolm's going to be um, able to join us for that talk. Um, as anyone who has heard him speak before understands that he takes what can be a very complex subject and make it very accessible. The following week, um, our, I've already mentioned that um, our project partners, SSEN, Mel Bryce from SSEN will be joining us and talking about all the successes and what we've learned from that first year. Um, and now we're in the world of Zoom, the great thing is Mel lives up in, um, up in Scotland, but she can join us through the power of the internet without having to jump on a plane, which is great news. So um, that's about forthcoming webinars. I can see lots of questions coming in, but um, I'm going to um, pause there for a second. I can see Barbara's been answering some. Let's make sure we do as we promised and start answering some questions. Barbara, if you, should we, where should we go back up to? Is there, should we... Um, so we've done planning um, and uh, I think one thing that I just wanted to say that it's quite difficult to get into a, um, an answer on the uh, chat is that we've taken advice from uh, a very experienced planning lawyer who has looked at all of the policies in the local plans that um, we have across the, the five districts and very surprisingly to us um, despite what we thought were some very strong statements about um, what people are required to do her view is that um, none of the policies in the plans are really strong enough um, to get what we need coming out of public inquiries and definitely not at all strong enough to get the um, to get all of the um, applications for new renewable installations um, having to prove a community benefit in doing that so one of the things that we're doing is working to improve that situation. Uh, Barbara we had a question from Hugh who has um, come across um, the work of Tesla in the US supplying solar roof tiles for houses yeah. do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah I've, I've um, I made a um, a little response to Hugh and talked about roof trees rather than rooftops. I'm sorry about that, fat finger syndrome. Um, just to make the point um, really clearly, hopefully at this point, is the, the feed-in tariff finished um, at the end of March 2019. And then there was another six months for community energy projects, a sort of extension for community energy projects, and a further six months um, for um, community energy projects because of COVID. But we're effectively beyond the feed-in tariff now. And that uh, means that, um, you know, from, from our point of view, just before going on to what it means, um, our view is that that was slightly too early um, because prices, solar prices in particular, um, hadn't come down far enough to make a seamless transition from the feed-in tariff to what's called grid parity, where you can produce energy at the same um, retail cost as the incumbent technologies. Um, 
but even even so even if it had been delayed slightly there would still be the question of how you make a project investable without a feed-in tariff because the feed-in tariff is brilliant it's paid on every single kilowatt hour that you generate and it's linked to inflation and it's not just cpi it's rpi which is about one percent um, higher than CPI, CPI generally. So it's a really great gold plated um, uh, underpinning to uh, renewable energy projects. That being gone, we are now dependent on selling the energy, supplementing that, that, that sale price or um, the uh, upsiding is the jargon uh, on that, those sales with selling flexibility services selling energy services um, and the issue about all of that uh, the sales the flexibility services the energy services is that you're stacking up lots of little bits of revenue all of which depend on a separate contract and pulling all of that together in a way that is um, really solid and safe and secure and investable in the way that people have become used to with a feed-in tariff is quite difficult and one of the things that project leo allows us to do for ourselves and on behalf of others is to try all of this new world out in a way that's helped along by the project leo innovate uk grant funding um, so it's a really important thing that we're doing for the future beyond leo and for community energy organizations right across the country we've had a um comment from ian geddes from sanford who's aware of a very large um solar farm that's planned for um the area in the baldens parish um and perhaps let's say a little bit more about um about that because i think first of all it was a question relating to the size of it so was there still need for for more um solar and what might be the impact um, and i think also um i'm i might just kick off by saying that um for us community ownership is something that we're very keen particularly on ground mounts where um it means that by going into community ownership it gives us an opportunity for that local community to have more of a say and more of an influence on a project that's happening on its doorstep um, we're also really keen um, that you think not just about the, the wider environmental benefits when something like a ground mount solar is planned uh, but also the immediate impact on local ecology and there's been some great work from other community solar cooperatives um, in the county that we'll certainly be learning from about how you can manage the land in a way that's best for the local di um, biodiversity but Bar Barbara perhaps you could say more about in terms of the actual volume of um, electricity that will be generated um so the we're aware um of the um of the big um application um at bolden and it's in line with the sort of size of applications we're seeing in quite a few different places what i would say is that um those applications are coming in um as a way of sort of marking out the territory so um and they won't go ahead and be built until the market supports them um, and the other thing to, to be said is that the way the market is tending at the moment and the way that government policy is tending at the moment it's really driving the scale up and not supporting the smaller schemes or domestic schemes in the, in the way that we've we have seen previously with policy so where the game is at at the moment is is that size of solar um i don't necessarily you know you can tell from the way that i'm making the response that um i don't like the market being driven to, to scale in that way necessarily but i would also say that i think it's a necessary thing to have alongside a market that supports um activity at the smaller scale um, because just because of, the, of the, the scale of installation that we need to have if we're going to get to 2030 so that one of the Boldens will add to our need to increase sixfold and in in those terms it's a good thing 
what I would like policies, planning pro policies across the county to do is to support, um, to be really strong about how those projects should also provide community benefit. They should also um, be required to include the community in getting direct benefit from them. Um, and indirectly, therefore, supports the work that we're trying to do to include everybody in this new system across the county. So we had a question from Jan as to what happens if we're unfortunate and don't manage to um, get the projects that we wanted um, lined up um, to spend the capital. First of all is a couple of those projects have already happened. So we do already need capital for that, um, for those roof mounted projects. And we've got a pipeline that's always being considered for roof mounted solar. The ground mounts, we've got um, three projects currently under investigation, but um, if um, and the, for us they're very important not just because um, having announced a share offer we're very keen to make them happen but they're really very crucial for Project LEO so we really will be doing everything we can to make sure that um, we um, can continue to grow our renewable portfolio but ultimately if we are unsuccessful we would be returning investor capital invested in this round um, but it's still our ambition to pay the interest payment um, for the time that we at least had your capital. Let's go on. Um, any progress on replacements for EIS? EIS for those of you who um, may have invested in the past, um, the Enterprise Investment Scheme was a tax allowance which was available in the early days of community energy and unfortunately there does not seem to be any movement at the moment in the government um, on tax breaks for um, investors it has been something that um, the um, community energy england has been lobbying for as um, um, ever since that stopped but to my knowledge there doesn't appear to be anything happening and in fact also there's a social or oh, CETA what does CETA stand for Barbara it's social investment tax relief thank you which was not available to um, renewable energy projects but to other social um, enterprise investments is also um, potentially at risk as well now do you have anything else to say on that Barbara um, it's going to be very interesting to see I and mean, it's very difficult to forecast government policy given the situation that we're in um, I would expect tax reliefs to be one of one of the things that are, is really under question it was before covid it must be even more post covid um paul asks about any concerns we have about dropping electricity prices um especially at, at the moment yes um yes <laughs> um so i think there's an, another question from um Seema as well, Seema Dave from the county on uh, the same question. So um, just to give a sort of, for those who, who aren't following the news on this, a, a sense of the scale of it, um, the power purchase agreement prices that we're being quoted at the moment from our normal um, provider uh, are tw about £24 a megawatt hour where they used to be in the high £50 per megawatt hour. Um, now you would expect that these energy prices would be a blip because of covid i mean the energy demand has 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 really reduced dramatically um, through the covid period um, and that they would recover um, once we're back out of um, lockdown again but it is something that's uh, a concern it's something that we're tracking very carefully and um, we're um, modeling our financial models in quite a pessimistic way not as pessimistic i have to say as 24 pounds a megawatt hour um, but we are forecasting pessimistically and we will not close on any project um, unless we're satisfied that it will work um, and that's one of the reasons why um, we're still working on bringing the projects in that saski was referring to earlier everything's taking a lot longer because of covid but we still think it's important to raise the money to have our investor capital there so that we can be saying to any project that comes through yep we're in there we can do this because we have this money behind us so 
um, it's difficult times. Uh, in terms of our um, existing projects and the existing situation, we've, we're constantly modeling this and um, as well as driving projects to scale with the current set of policies, what I would also say is that the current policies really benefit projects that are rooftop projects that are modeled to meet as far as possible the energy demand of the host. And we've always been very careful to do that at the Low Carbon Hub. So our current portfolio of projects is really very little exposed to those problems because we sell the vast majority of our, our energy to, to our hosts. So yeah, Paul was asking what levels we're modeling. Um, the um, sort of base model is included in the share offer document if you're interested in looking at that in more detail. But so we're constantly, the team are constantly uh, monitoring what current prices are. Um, but it's also, it's about those longer term PPA prices as well, which um, we also need to keep an eye on. And we're very fortunate that we have some um, experts in the industry um, on our board who help us with that kind of detail. Yeah, um, it just just that's a good point Saski which I'll just elaborate on for a, a tiny while um, we have an investment committee as Saski was saying which um, has people on it who are very well versed um, in all of these issues in their professional lives and uh, we have to get their recommendation to the board and then board approval of that recommendation before we can do anything um, and uh, we've been really well served by that process to date and um, just on this point just Saskia um, um, the um, PPA price that we're currently modeling as the pessimistic one is 39 pounds and building on that Seema was asking it was an interest to know if the um, current change in energy demand and implications on solar production that might have yeah um, and it's the same response really as we gave um, earlier about the current situation with, with COVID. Um, but it's quite interesting that this has happened during Project LEO because it's, a, it's like, okay guys, this is a, a case study of how things are going to be in 2030. So that's, that really helps us to think about it. Doesn't help us to do new things, but it really helps us to think about the situation that we're gaily marching ourselves into. Um, and it really points up the need to be able to move energy through time. How do you do that? You have to store it. How do you make that uh, a viable thing to add into the whole system? So returning to a point I was making earlier about the importance about the wider sustainability and the biodiversity of the um, Grand Mount solar sites. Thank you, Tanya, for your question about um, planting and um, alongside solar and greenfield sites. Um, absolutely, that we'd love to follow up with you on the point that you've made there. Um, we we have seen some great examples in terms of that improved biodiversity on sites and as you say careful planting partly for screening partly for the biodiversity is something that we'd really be looking into and we're trying to build our knowledge and expertise on that so um we'll be following up with you if that's all right um and a question from guy johnson about um um in if ices um this particular share raise isn't because it's equity is not applicable my understanding is that it would have to be a bond um, but um, I would suggest that if you're interested in that kind of area chatting to somebody like ethics and looking at their website that's e-t-h-e-x ethics um, have got some blogs and some more information on their platform about um, IFISs let's see have we missed any questions there Barbara um, I think we haven't. I think we've been quite um, diligent in going through all of those and it's been great to see all the questions coming. I do love this way of running conferences because everybody can get their say. It's really great. It's a, a last moment. If you think we've missed your question or you have a last minute question before we wrap up, 
do please pop it now in the chat. Otherwise, it really just leaves us to say, first of all, we hope you've enjoyed this session. We'd love your feedback. As I say, it's the first time we've run one. So we really need your feedback so that we can um, understand how we can improve and make them um, most enjoyable and interesting to you. Second of all, a reminder that we've got um, two webinars already scheduled and more in the pipeline. So please um, do sign up for those and we, because um, we'd love it to become a regular Tuesday night activity, coming and talking about things low carbon. Um, if you um, are thinking of investing in the Community Energy Fund, please remember that the 10th of June is the deadline. You can do it all online and all the information is on our website at lowcarbonhub.org forward slash invest. Um, but if you have um, any other questions as well that pop up afterwards, just pop them to us at info at lowcarbonhub.org and the same um, info at lowcarbonhub.org for any feedback and suggestions about how we can improve our webinar series and also any topics that you'd like us to cover, any areas that we might have touched on that you'd love to learn a lot more about. So I think that just leaves us to say a great big thank you for joining us and um, we hope to um, be in touch with all of you in the near future and hopefully see you at future webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Is everyone still on? <laughs>